Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keen Fitzgerald. I am the Security and Defence and Foreign Policy Researcher here at the IIEA. I'm pleased to welcome you to this IIEA webinar on the topic of the Gaza War and the Crisis of the Greater Middle East. And we're delighted to be joined today by F. Gregory Gauls III, Professor and John H. Lindsay, 44, Chair at Texas A&M University's Bush School of Government and Public Service. Against the backdrop of a deteriorating humanitarian situation in Gaza, and escalating tensions in the Middle East more generally, Professor Gauze's address is as timely as it is important. Professor Gauze will speak to us for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll go to the Q&A with our audience. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, uh, which you should see on your screen. And please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you, and we'll come to them once Professor Gauze has finished his presentation. And just to remind everyone attending that today's presentation and Q&A will both be on the record. Please feel free to join the discussion on X using the handle at IIEA. And I will now formally introduce Professor Gauze and then hand over to him. Professor F. Gregory Gauze III is Professor of International Affairs and John H. Lindsay, 44, Chair at the Bush School of Government and Public, and Public Service at Texas A&M University. His research focuses on the international politics of the Middle East, with a particular focus on the Arabian Peninsula and the Persian Gulf. He has published three books, and most of most recently, the international relations of the public Gulf of the, of the Persian Gulf, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2010. Professor Gauze, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to join you, and and thanks for the invitation. What I'd like to do today is make the case that the war in Gaza, uh, even though it has very specific historical and and contemporary uh, causes and antecedents is actually part of a much larger regional crisis that I think is uh, can be characterized as, as created by and caused by the weakening and collapse of state authority in so many parts of the Middle East and specifically within the Arab world itself, not exclusively, but, but, but very much focused within the Arab world. Uh, and that, and that the, the, the elements of the Gaza war, while specifically unique to the Arab Israel, the history of the Arab Israeli conflict, are not unique in terms of the larger crisis that, that, the, that the Middle East is facing. So let me proceed to try to break that down and, and, and sell you on this idea that Gaza is, in fact, one more conflict of, of a larger regional crisis the solution of which will not be easy and will not be will not happen in the short term. That's for sure. Uh, obviously, the Gaza War has very specific causes. In the uh, the 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 history of Israeli Palestinian relations, in the particular dynamic between Hamas in Gaza and the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, in the larger context of of the of the steady movement to the right of Israeli politics. And, and, and by right in that context, of course, I mean the, the, the belief that, that uh, Israel should hold on to all of the territories that it, uh, that it currently controls, even those in the West Bank and the Golan Heights and, and indirectly in Gaza that it obtained in the 1967 war. Uh, uh, that rightward trend in Israel that makes the two-state solution, a, a Palestinian state next to an Israeli state, even less possible. Uh, the trends in the Arab world, represented by the Abraham Accords and by the, uh, the, the very public uh, effort by the United States to bring Saudi Arabia and Israel into a normal diplomatic relations. All of these trends, uh, even without a two-state solution, Obviously, the Abraham Accords and the and the Israeli Saudi American triangular relationship. All of these things, I think, set the stage for the uh, attacks of October seventh and the Israeli counterattacks that continue up to this day. But I I, I make the the larger point in in this talk that that the Gaza War is a manifestation of a larger crisis in the region, and very specifically in a number of Arab states. And the cause of this is the weakening or collapse of central state authority. And this weakening or collapse of, of central state authority does a number of things which complicate 
the international relations of the region. One, it empowers non-state actors, right? Non-state actors, which in a, in a, a, a more well-functioning state would be under the control of the, of the state authority, but with state authority weakened or collapsed, these non-state actors can in fact act independently, militarily and even diplomatically in terms of, of developing relations with outside powers, inviting those outside powers into their domestic civil conflicts. So the weakening of, of the state also opens the door to foreign intervention. And as we see in, in so many of these conflicts, uh, these interventions by foreign powers are, 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 are not, th these foreign powers don't have to fight their way into these conflicts, they're invited into the conflicts by the parties themselves who desperately seek the, the money, the guns, the diplomatic support of these foreign actors. The weakening of the state also opens up the door to, to refugee problems. So we've seen this in Libya, we've seen this in Syria, we've seen this throughout the region. Uh, and, and thus the collapse or weakening of central state authority uh, not only creates problems regionally, but those problems, as everyone in Europe knows, spill over into other regions and, and create broader international uh, issues that are not contained within the region itself. So this crisis of the weakening of the Arab state, the collapse in some cases of the Arab state, this crisis defines the geopolitics of the Middle East, more I would argue than sectarianism, more than the specifics of Arab-Israeli tensions, more than great power moves in the region. It is this crisis of the state that defines the crisis of the international relations of the Middle East. So what are the origins of this crisis? Well, first off, what do I mean by a weak state? I don't mean a state that is internationally weak, that, that perhaps doesn't have a sufficient military force to, uh, to protect itself against larger neighbors. I always use Kuwait as a great example of, what I, uh, of distinguishing a weak state internationally from a weak state domestically. Kuwait, of course, is a relatively weak state internationally uh, when they, uh, when the Iraqis invaded in 1990, the Kuwaitis could resist for about 12 hours. However, I would argue Kuwait is a very strong state in terms of its domestic structures, its infrastructural power, right? Most of the Kuwaiti citizens identify with their government. Uh, the government maintains a, a relatively effective welfare state. It means, uh, maintains a relatively effective security, internal security force that can fend off efforts by outsiders to intervene in the politics of the country. It, uh, it, it polices its borders relatively well. This is a relatively strong state in terms of its infrastructural power. The problem in the Middle East now is that many, many states can't make those claims. Now, there are always weak states in terms of domestic weakness in the Arab world. Lebanon was basically created as a weak state. And the leaders of the various sectarian communities that made up the Lebanese polity kind of agreed among themselves that they would try to maintain the social power and economic power within their own communities and not have a state, have a larger state try to control their communities. And so Lebanon has been, was beset by civil war in the 1970s by international interventions, the Syrians, the Israelis, number of other parties, and finally the United States and European parties in the early 80s. Right? Uh, but, and Yemen also has been a relatively weak state, poor, uh, difficult to establish a, a strong central government. But these states were peripheral. Right? They were on the edges, they were small, they were not particularly strategic, uh, although they did invite that foreign intervention, most notably in, 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 in Lebanon in the 70s and 80s. Uh, but in the, in, in the rest of the Arab world, the trend from the 1960s, 70s, 80s, into the 80s and 90s was for the state to be strengthened. Oil wealth allowed states to, to develop their infrastructural power, both in terms of 
of welfare benefits they could give to people, but also their security services. You know, I don't want to say that these states were particularly friendly or nice, right? Many, uh, they, and they certainly weren't democratic, but they were much stronger in their ability to vest the interests of their citizens in the central authority and in and having central authority be able to control society. Uh, and thus the Arab world, which had been beset with military coups and, and changes of governments in the 40s and 50s right, and, and into the 60s, kind of notorious for its domestic political instability, actually became extremely stable in terms of domestic politics. Right? Regimes lasted for decades. Hafez al-Assad took over in Syria in 1970, and his son is still the president of Syria. Right. The military has ruled Egypt since 1952 with that little hiatus right after the Arab Spring. Uh, you can think of the Ba'athist regime, which ruled Iraq from 1968 up until the American invasion of 2003. And the monarchical regimes in Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Morocco, smaller Arab states. Uh, very stable polities by the end of the 20th century. So what changes? to create this 21st century crisis of the weak Arab state. Well, we had the US invasion of Iraq in 2003. Uh, it, it, it was American policy uh, driven by hubris and driven by what I think of as the derangement in American foreign policy created by the attacks of September 11th, 2001, that US policy in Iraq was, was deliberately to destroy the state to destroy what was left of an Iraqi state that had been weakened by the, the, the misgovernment of Saddam Hussein and by uh, extremely strict economic sanctions. Take what was left of that state and destroy it intentionally in the misbegotten belief that the United States could rebuild from the ground up. Oh, re sorry about that. Something just fell in my little office here. Um, that, wasn't, that wasn't a bomb or anything, don't worry. Um, to rebuild the, the Iraqi state from the ground up into a, a, a stable, democratic, pro-American Iraqi state at peace with Israel. This was a, a fantasy as, as was obviously demonstrated over the past 20 years. Uh, but it, it, it turned Iraq, which had been a player in Middle East politics into a playing field. Right? By destroying the Iraqi state, it opened it up to interventions, most notably by Iran and Iran's uh, allies and proxies within Iraqi politics. So that was 2003. Then we get to the Arab uprisings of 2011, where we saw civil wars in Libya and Yemen and Syria and regime crises in Egypt and Tunisia and Bahrain. These are not peripheral states. Right? These are, are states in the center of Middle Eastern politics. And so the combination of the American intervention in Iraq, the invasion of Iraq of 2003, and the Arab uprisings of 2011 created a number of political vacuums in the heart of the Middle East, in the heart of the Arab world, Iraq, Syria, and, and then more on the periphery, Libya, Yemen, plus Lebanon, which had uh, been a weak, weakened state you know, from the 1970s, if you will. These political vacuums in the center of the region and at its peripheries right, define the, the, the crisis that the region is experiencing right now. And they define that crisis because they invite foreign intervention. The country that's been best positioned to take advantage of this change in the regional political, uh, political scene has been Iran. The sectarian factor is real here. And, and I, don't wanna, I don't wanna underestimate sectarianism and certainly to an Irish audience, I, I don't need to talk about sectarianism as, a, as, as, as a, a, a pole around which people can mobilize politically. And, and that such mobilization can lead to violence. But I don't think that we should view this purely through a sectarian lens, purely through the Sunni versus Shia lens, right? 
I think that that there's a tendency to see the crisis as something, uh, the, the regional crisis, something imposed from the outside. The Iranians and the Saudis, maybe a little bit the Turks, kind of impose their sectarian notion of politics upon these countries. And that that has what's led to the instability and the violence that we see in the world. I actually think it's just the opposite. I think it's a bottom up process, which is to say that when the central state breaks down, people look to uh, whatever communities they feel safest in, right? Uh, Communities where their, their, their physical safety can be guaranteed, communities where their economic, basic economic needs can be met, uh, communities in which, in, in essence, they won't be killed and their children won't be killed when they go outside their homes. Uh, that kind of, and, and for historical reasons, in so many parts of, of the Eastern Arab world, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, to some extent Yemen, uh, those kinds of communities right, have been largely not completely secular. You have the Kurds in, in, in Iraq and, and in Syria, who are ethno-national uh, group, not a, not, not a sectarian group. There's Sunni Kurds and Shia Kurds, right? Uh, but Kurdish identity is more salient in, in the community, that national identity. But as the governments collapsed in these places or, or were severely weakened, we saw the, the, the rising importance of sectarianism in, in political identification. And, and it's, it's natural for Shia groups in these countries to look to Iran, right? The largest Shia country in the region for support. And the Iranians had an excellent strategy for dealing with that. They were very comfortable dealing with non-state actors. They had experimented with this from the early days of the revolution, from the early 1980s with the establishment of Hezbollah in Lebanon. And, and in that sense, Iran's strategy gave them an advantage in dealing with these fractured political uh, landscapes throughout the Arab world, gave the Iranians entry points. And the Iranian revolutionary ideology linked them to many of these Shia groups in these fractured Arab states, to the extent that Iran's allies, like Hezbollah and its proxies in, 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 in Iraq, and, and the Syrian government, which quickly became just one militia among many in Syria, they wanted to become part of the Iranian regional project. Right? They didn't have to be forced into this. They were enthusiastic participants in it. And thus Iran has predominant influence today in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Syria, and significant influence in Yemen with the Houthis. In many ways, the Houthis were more anxious to be Iranian proxies than the Iranians were to be their patrons. But it was, so, uh, it was such an obvious and easy way for the Iranians to poke the Saudis that they had become the Houthis' major supplier of, of guns and money. Uh, but it's not purely sectarian, right? If you look at Libya, where everyone's a Sunni Muslim, you see the same dynamic. Although society dividing more on regional, tribal, ideological lines. So it's the same dynamic, but it's not sectarian. It's the same dynamic because it's the same cause, the collapse of central state authority, right? And we see that sectarianism isn't the overarching theme of, 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 of this crisis with the, the close relationship that Hamas, a Sunni Islamist organization in Palestine, uh, has, has developed with Iran. Right? So the Iranians have been the most successful players in this game. In the immediate aftermath of the Arab uprisings of 2011, it looked like Turkey would also be able to wield considerable regional influence because Turkey had set itself up under the, 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 uh, the government of uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan and his Justice and Development Party, a, a, a bottom-up populist, quasi-democratic, less so these days, quasi-democratic uh, Sunni Islamist party. Right? It looked like similar parties, Muslim Brotherhood parties, were doing very well in the Arab world in the post 2011 uprisings, right? The elections in Tunisia and in Libya and in Egypt all returned 
Sunni Islamists, the, the Muslim Brotherhood specifically in Egypt, uh, Al Nahda, which is kind of like the, the Brotherhood branch in Tunisia, Islamists in, in, in Libya. And there was a strong belief in Turkey and in many other places that the civil war in Syria would lead to uh, a Muslim Brotherhood government there. And thus it, it looked like Turkey was riding high. However, the, 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 the boomlet of the Brotherhood right, quickly receded as the military and, and, and uh, elites of the old regime, if you will, kind of stepped in in Tunisia and Egypt to, to, to squash the Brotherhood and Libya uh, collapsed into civil war. And so uh, the, the, Turkish, the Turkish move to influence basically failed. Saudi Arabia did not have these kinds of regional allies or proxies that Iran or, 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 or Turkey did. Uh, their ideological potential proxies, uh, the Salafi jihadists, uh, ISIS and, and Al Qaeda, hate the Saudis and want to kill the Saudis, right? The Saudis are much, much better at dealing with states than they are at dealing with non-state actors. And thus the Saudis really had very little entryway into this crisis except to support states, support their fellow monarchy in Bahrain when it faced its regime crisis in 2011, uh, transfer along with the United Arab Emirates, uh, billions of dollars to the military government in Egypt of General uh, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, right? Uh, and thus for the Saudis, you know, intervening in these broken states has been a very, very difficult thing and, and they haven't had much success. So what's to be done? Uh, the solution here might seem simple, rebuild state authority. But achieving that is hardly simple, right? We know historically that, that states are built, they tend to be built by, by hard and violent men and, and they're almost always men certainly in the Middle East. Uh, the United States had tens of thousands of troops in Iraq, tens of thousands of troops in Afghanistan. Afghanistan spent hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars in those countries and absolutely failed to build stable regimes in either of those places. So if reconstituting functioning states is a necessary prerequisite, for a more stable and peaceful Middle East, then the US and Europe are going to have to deal with some unsavory and difficult characters like Bashar al-Assad, who with the support of Russia and the Iranians has basically won the Syrian civil war. And Muqtada al-Sabr, the extremely difficult uh, leader of what is really the largest faction in Iraqi politics the Houthis in Yemen. This is not a particularly attractive set of players to deal with, but it will be necessary to deal with them. I think it's foolish to think that the choices that we face in the Middle East are between good governance and bad governance, or between authoritarianism and democracy. The real choice is between some amount of order or continuing regional chaos and instability. And I think if we think about the problem that way, our choices might become clearer.